Hello and welcome to another submarine show. This one's going to be about Sweden's nuclear powered submarine program. Today, the A26 class submarine, which is what you see here, is among the most innovative and modern submarines under construction anywhere in the world and is a really interesting design in its own right. In general, Swedish submarine designers have always done their own thing. And it makes their designs particularly interesting, I think, worthy of a lot more videos than you, you find. I'm going to talk about a much older project, though, but encompasses the same sort of innovation and forward thinking, the nuclear powered submarine program of Sweden. Like my other talks, this is going to be unscripted. That's really obvious already. Also don't have a great microphone, not apologizing for that, but just to save you the effort of writing comments about it. It is what it is. You're here for the content anyway, um, so let's get on with it. Nuclear powered submarines started in the 1950s with the US Navy's USS Nautilus, and this really revolutionized submarine capabilities. Also in the 1950s, the Russians started to follow suit and build nuclear powered submarines. After that, it was the British in the 1960s who were next with the nuclear powered submarine. But in the meantime, other countries also looked to nuclear powered submarines. In fact, it was the logical thing that all submarines were going to become nuclear powered. It was so much better from a propulsion perspective in terms of the endurance and the ability to remain submerged and the speed that it gave submarines. Among these was Sweden. Additionally, at the same time, the Swedish Navy enjoyed a really strong connection to the US Navy, much stronger than people realize, I think. The US Navy was also experimenting with the shape of submarines, not just the propulsion, but also the shape. And USS Albacore seen here, which was launched in, in the early 50s, again, revolutionized submarine design. It's the first submarine with the modern generic a prototypical shape of a submarine if you get a if you get a five-year-old to draw a submarine it looks like this and all submarines since then pretty much look a lot like this sweden had access to this research and if the the relationship between the swedish navy and the american navy cannot be underestimated it, it was massive and it meant that the swedish submarine designs the designers had access to insights that were really cutting edge on the world stage, perhaps more so than anyone other than maybe Britain and, and of course America. So Sweden started to design their own nuclear submarine in the 1950s, and it looked like a combination of the Albacore class with its uh, sort of teardrop or Albacore hull and nuclear propulsion. And the design was really out there. And you can see from this official image from the time, this sketch, they were really forward thinking. I think it looks super cool. The first blueprints that I can find are from 1956. I have to say at this point that this uh, video and the research behind it would not have been possible without Frederick Granholm, who was a Swedish um, submariner and researcher and historian, and I owe everything to him really for this. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but I'm going to share the material that he shared with me. This design, um, some blueprints from 1956, you can see that I don't have the complete picture. I had to fill in the gaps in some places. But straight away, it's obvious that this is a really forward thinking design. It's really bold for 1950s. It's essentially fish shaped. Um, the hull is a different diameter all the way along, it's super efficient. Another really interesting feature, not perhaps not obvious at first, but a big deal is that it doesn't have normal rudders and hydroplanes at the back. It doesn't have the control surfaces you see on every other submarine. Instead, it has a very large variable pitch screw or propeller. And they would vary the pitch of this propeller to act a bit like thrust vectoring, really forward thinking at the time. Another feature that's quite interesting is that at the back of the, the sail or the, uh, the, the fin or coning pair, is a small rudder. So there's a rudder on the sail instead of being at the back. That's actually borrowed from USS Albacore. It's one of the things that they experimented with on, on the Albacore. So it really shows how closely connected the Swedish designers were to the US research almost in real time. 
Another interesting feature are the forward hydroplanes. These are almost like wings and they're really big and they're, they're angled slightly down. I think it, aesthetically, it looks awesome. Um, there were some designs a little bit like this. I can see some precursors, in, especially in Japanese submarine side, but this was really forward thinking. This is gonna be a highly agile submarine, almost flying underwater. So it's started to become a real project. And one of the big questions was how they're gonna power this new submarine. They came up with three ideas and they started to develop these in parallel with each other. The first was an atomic or nuclear powered submarine, the A11A. The A11B would be diesel electric. That was also new at the time. Diesel submarines had been around a long time, but in the fifties, they started to use the diesel engines to power, uh, generate electricity for an electric motor and not power the, the propeller directly. So that was quite forward thinking, um, UK, America doing that. And then the A11C was gonna be air independent propulsion. Again, there's a lot of research in air independent propulsion in the 1950s. I'm gonna cover all three of these, but in particular the atomic or, or A model. The A11 is just the sequential number for the design. Currently we're on the A26, a11 is just the 11th Swedish submarine design since they started using that number system. So they started doing tests. This is hydrodynamic model. Um, really interesting, a lot of serious research. The first design that I have the blueprints for that's sort of detailed as it were is 1957 nuclear version. And this submarine is really interesting in a lot of ways. I did a cutaway of it. Um, but before I just look at the stats a bit, it's less than a thousand tons, it's less than 50 meters long, which is about 160 foot thereabouts. It makes it really small, much smaller than other nuclear powered submarines. And its crew was also really small, only 20 people, but its speed would have been really incredible for the time, over 25 knots. Um, that was crazy speed at the time, not the fastest, so I have to say, you know, Obviously, the US Navy had much bigger nuclear powered submarines and quickly Russian and American submarines were getting up to 30 knots and beyond. But this is uh, really, really fast. Also, really interesting armament. I'll come to that. So, this is my cutaway of it. This is available on my website with full annotations, hsun.com. I'll put a link in the description, of course. Um, the first interesting thing about this submarine is the weapons. Instead of having a normal torpedo room, it actually had a rotary, as in rotating, magazine of torpedoes external to the hull in the, in the flooded uh, ballast tank, essentially. And these were smaller 400 millimeter torpedoes. It had 20 of them. And so that's the yellow um, objects going around the outside. Also had six fixed torpedo tubes for heavyweight torpedoes in the center. These did not have any reloads, which was pretty typical thinking at the time and then still is an option reloading torpedoes um, takes time so if you can have more in ready to use tubes the better they were able to bring a torpedo out of the tube to be for maintenance but they couldn't store any torpedoes inside the submarine they were all stored in the torpedo tubes i have to say at this point also that as well as being nuclear powered it was going to be nuclear armed I don't have much details on this at all, but, new, but Sweden had a nuclear power, uh, sorry, a nuclear weapons program. There's no doubt about that. And it's a working assumption of everyone who has awareness of this project that these torpedoes at some point would be nuclear armed. Don't have anything specific on that. The nuclear propulsion is also interesting. You can see the spherical, um, uh, protective, you know, shielded uh, vessel in the middle. That's the reactor um, vessel. We know quite a lot about this reactor because surprisingly, perhaps it was not classified. This was actually a civilian government project to develop a general purpose nuclear propulsion, primarily for ships. Sweden had a massive shipbuilding industry at the time, merchant vessels, that sort of thing. And with the nuclear honeymoon, everyone thought that pretty much all ships would become nuclear power. That wasn't an unreasonable guess. And Sweden started to develop a nuclear propulsion system for that. And then that same system would be used on the submarine. So, this, so the nuclear propulsion wasn't classified. We've got a lot of drawings of it. It's called Project Neptune. Interesting, so right. I don't know much about nuclear. I'll leave it at that. 
By 1958, the design was evolving quite a bit. It's overall quite similar, but if in detail, if you look really closely, you see lots of differences. The main ones to point out, instead of having the variable pitch screw at the back, it's got a much more smaller and simple regular propeller. About this time, they really figured out that all the advantages of the variable pitch screw, you know, the efficiency and the ability to use it for steering were outweighed by the complexity and weight. Um, basically, they started to have a normal screw. The, um, the rudders are redesigned. I think the lower rudder being a different shape like that implies that submarines designed to sit on the bottom. That's an interesting prospect for nuclear powered submarines at this time, um, but we don't know that for sure. That design was smaller still. It's getting to less than 150 foot long, 43 meters, um, still less than 700 tons. Got quite a small power plant, only 400 short horsepower, but same weapons, six heavyweight torpedoes plus 20 lightweight torpedoes. Incredible weapon load for the time, and especially for such a small submarine. By 1962, the design was evolving. Again, you can see the knowledge being gained in America and the UK being shared with Sweden, particularly America, of course. The submarine is now looking more of a sausage shape, more cylindrical with rounded ends. Essentially, they've elongated it versus the more shark-like um, or fish-like hull earlier. They'd figured out that the, the gains of having a single uh, hull diameter for most of the submarine is much easier to build, um, and it doesn't lose very much in terms of speed. Whereas the submarines before, um, had been a different hull diameter all the way along, more or less, and that would make them harder to build. The nuclear power plant is more or less the same. The main difference here is going to be in the weapons. But if we look at the stats, it's much bigger submarine. We're now going to over a 1,000 tonnes, still tiny compared to a regular submarine, a uh, nuclear powered one, that is, um, but much smaller. And still got a tiny crew, only 21 people. Now, if you say that to a US Navy or a Royal Navy submarine, we're going to have a nuclear power submarine and we're going to uh, you know, attack submarine with only 21 crew, they'd think you're crazy. But Sweden does have a history of really small crews for their submarines. Automation is really high. Their combat efficiency, you know, there's a lot of context there and the, the missions would be much shorter, of course, in the Baltic. What's interesting, at this time, the US Navy was experimenting with having a single person drive the submarine. That's what you have today. But US Navy never adopted it. The Swedes did. They took that research from US S Albert Corps and actually applied it in real submarines in the 60s. The armament is a bit different. Um, I say essentially it's gone from these rotary launchers to a much more conventional torpedo tube and torpedo room arrangement. You still have a mix of heavyweight and lightweight torpedoes, which is a peculiarly Swedish thing at the time. Um, there's a few issues with the rotary launcher. They did actually try those rotary launchers on real submarines and they found a set of problems. The first was that because the torpedoes are surrounded by water all times, they need a lot more maintenance. So that's a pain. Additionally, they had a lot of electrical problems with those torpedoes because they're um, in water all the time, the electric circuits to connect to them and things like that. Um, again, had maintenance problems. The last one was more a future problem. The rotary launchers wouldn't have allowed for wire guided torpedoes because the, the launch is moving, it, it rotates. So it would break the line of the, um, the wire guidance. So from a future point perspective, it's much better to have regular torpedo tubes. And that's what they did here. Other than that, the design becoming more sensible, let's say more typical, um, but not particularly uh, um, different or noteworthy, really. Nuclear power also had a problem then. The main one from a build perspective is that it's incredibly expensive. And it was much more complicated and expensive to build a nuclear power submarine than Sweden had realized in the 50s. The second one, and I don't know how big a factor this was, but in the 60s and onwards, nuclear power became quite unpopular. Nuclear weapons became unpopular. Um, this is a protest in Stockholm in 1960, I believe. I'm, I'm, I understand that this had an influence 
on the decision not to build a nuclear powered submarine, um, but I don't know exactly how much. So of the three designs, we start to see problems with the atomic, the nuclear powered one. Let's talk a bit about the AIP one. This was actually the main design as I understand it. The nuclear was never the primary choice. It was a bit too adventurous. Instead, they were gonna build an AIP something. That means air independent propulsion. Key thing here is to use some sort of motor that can drive underwater without needing oxygen from the air to, to run, which is what diesel engines need, of course. So they were gonna do it with a combination of liquid oxygen and alcohol as a fuel and run essentially an alcohol driven engine. Here's the liquid oxygen, it's a massive tank built into a structure of submarine. And the, the uh, alcohol was stored in really interesting tubular flasks running around the outside of the submarine. That's a really interesting, I can see some connections with um, certain Italian designs and things. It, it's quite cool if you're into submarine design. Um, but the problem was that this was quite noisy. About that time, people were realizing that submarines needed to be stealthy and that noise produced by submarine was gonna be their main Achilles heel. This was more US and British observation being shared with the Swedes. Russia took much longer to really appreciate the importance of this, as we know, if you know your Cold War submarine history. But as an alternative to the noisy alcohol and liquid oxygen fuels, uh, AIP, a company called Acer um, started to propose an advanced fuel cell design. Fuel cells are what power AIP submarines today in many countries, not in Sweden, they use Stirling engines, but um, in many countries. So this is really advanced thinking to think in 1950s and 60s, people in Sweden were looking at um, uh, fuel cells. The company Acer, I don't know if they still exist. I don't actually know if I'm saying it right, but that's not saying it. They built a full scale working prototype, really impressive. And they were quite keen to promote this. The bad news was that that full-scale prototype caught fire literally the day before it's going to be demonstrated. Um, fire is a really bad thing in submarine. Essentially, the technology wasn't ready at the time. It was still too dangerous. So that can be said for a lot of technologies for propulsion in submarines. So what are we left with? The atomic or nuclear-powered one is too expensive. Nuclear is becoming unpopular. The AIP one was too noisy and then subsequently too dangerous. So we left with a diesel electric. And that is what we got. Um, the A11 class, as it was actually eventually built, was a really innovative, really forward thinking, conventional submarine with diesel electric propulsion. So not nuclear, not AIP. That would have to wait, the AIP. This submarine was really interesting in a few ways. You can still see the direct influence of the US's Albacore. At the time it was built, it was the first operational submarine in the world with X-form rudders. It got that research from the US Navy's Albacore design, and the Swedes were the first Navy to adopt it. Um, now lots of submarines have that. It's almost expected of submarines increasingly. The rest of the submarine, very small still, very potent, very good reputation, had stealth features, quietening, which was ahead of its time, or, or certainly um, an awareness of those features as ahead of its time. Just photos cool. On the back, you can see a R2 swimmer delivery vehicle. That was actually 1980s edition, um, purchased from Yugoslavia. Quite interesting, but, uh, but just an add-on. These submarines are still in service, but with the Singaporean Navy as the challenger class. Now they are very, very old, but they don't look that old. Um, it's really testament to the design. It's uh, one of the first and most modern um, non-nuclear submarines for a long time. And modern non-nuclear submarines owe a lot to this design, I'd say. Cool, so that is the A11 story, particularly the nuclear. Um, hope Hopefully you enjoyed it. Apologies, it is unscripted. That's the case um, with all my videos. It's also unmonetized. So if you like it, please like, please share, please comment, um, spread the word because I, I don't think these you know, the search engines will be that friendly to it. Um, but hopefully you appreciate it. Thank you very much.